<sighs> yeah, we all knew I was coming back to this. After months of putting this off in favor of making videos of other shit that I thought deserved some digesting, it's about fitting that I finish what I started so I don't have it breathing on the back of my neck for the coming months, and that is the work from Studio Ponic, a studio created in 2015 and made up by former Studio Ghibli employees. As of the making of this video, they have released two feature films, so unless I decide to make like 20 different videos in between, uh, it won't take 13 months to finish this one. The first of the two films I'm going to talk about today is Mary and the Witch's Flower, an action fantasy adventure film that has been hyped up to hell before its release due to the studio's famous connection, working under the never-ending man himself, Hayao Miyazaki, and was called either a Studio Ghibli homage or a ripoff, depending on who you ask after the film came out. But, of course, with any project related to anything, Studio Ghibli... There's a story behind the project, and of course, we're gonna go through all of it. My name is Payne, and this is Mary and the Witch's Flower. The story follows a girl named, you guessed it, Mary, after she moves in with her great aunt in Northern England, bored and irritated as any 11-year-old can be. That is, until she encounters a pair of cats who lead her to some mysterious glowing flower called a fly-by-night, yes, that's the actual title, which is connected to a legend that witches yearn to obtain it to gain its magical power. The next day, one of the cats just says fuck this and goes into the woods, prompting Mary to go after it. After a short time in the woods, Mary finds a broomstick caught in a tree's roots, but as she breaks it free, the broomstick accidentally hits a fly-by-night flower, making it come to life and fly in the air with Mary and one of the cats holding on, giving off the image of Mary flying on the broomstick like a witch. She eventually lands in Endor College for Witches and is mistaken as a new student by the college's headmistress and renowned chemistry teacher. Now forced to live up to her lie, Mary discovers a terrible secret at Endor College and it is up to her to risk her life and set things right. To get an idea of what the film itself means, we have to go back before Studio Ponic was founded in August of 2014, less than a month after the release of Studio Ghibli's last film, as of right now, when Marnie was there, when Toshio Suzuki, who was just hired as the new general manager after decades as the studio's renowned producer, announced that the feature film section of the studio was going to shut down following the retirement of Hayao Miyazaki, which led to speculation at the time that Ghibli wouldn't be making another feature film again. This news made a lot of employees concerned about their future at the studio, and two of those employees were director Hiromasa Yonabayashi, who had worked in the studio since 1996, and producer Yoshiaki Nishimura, who had worked with them since the early 2000s. I couldn't find a single year, but his first credit was when he worked on Howl's Moving Castle. To keep making films, they left the studio to create their own studio, Studio Ponic, which was founded in April of 2015. Their first project was for a TV ad for the West Japan Railway Company, a project that allowed not only money to flow in towards the film's budget, but also got some rust off of everyone involved after some time without working. As for the background artist that left Ghibli with the help of Studio Ponic, Studio Kara, led by the anime industry's crazy man Hideaki Yano, and a subsidiary of Katakawa called Duengo, led by Nobu Kawakami, the studio Deho Gallery was founded on July 1st, 2015, with legendary Ghibli background artist Kazuo Oga taking an advisory role. It would be in part from this studio, as well as from universally renowned background artist studio Studio Pablo, that Ponic would hire 450 staffers to work on Mary and the Witch's Flower, a film Studio Ponic worked on basically since they were founded. The project was kept on down low until the studio announced the release of the film in December of 2016 for the following July. As for the source material, this would be the first of many things both Ponic and this film would be compared to Ghibli, and that is, this movie was based on another piece of British literature. In this case, it was based on the 1971 novel The Little Broomstick by Mary Stewart. According to Yonobayashi in an interview, when Nishimura approached him with the book and the idea to adapt it, he even saw the Ghibli similarities, saying it reminded him of Miyazaki's 1989 film, Kiki's Delivery Service, another film about a young witch who rides on a broom. But Nishimura would explain it's different this time. In the book, and it's later shown in the film, instead of Mary getting herself in the same scenario I mentioned in the plot, 
and it's later discovered that she can get out of it because it turns out that she was born with magical powers all along and she never knew about it. It's actually quite the opposite. She doesn't have any magical powers, but with a lot of guts and confidence in her wits, she was able to achieve what she wanted. This is parallel to what Ponick was going through at the time, and everyone who worked on the film felt that. For their whole careers, Nishimura, Yonabayashi, and every staff member spent enough time at Ghibli to feel the confidence and energy and the quote-unquote magic of working under a brilliant mind like Hayao Miyazaki or the late Isao Takahata. Now, they don't have that anymore, leaving the Ponic staff in a position, and eventually a mindset, where it doesn't matter if the aura that was felt in the past is still there. The satisfaction of finishing a film would, would stay regardless. Another huge point in the story Nishimura noted to in a separate interview is that compared to the later films in Ghibli's catalog, movies like The Wind Rises, The Tale of the Princess Kaguya, and both of Yonobayashi's films, The Secret World of Arietti and When Marnie Was There, they all have the common theme of departing or letting someone go. In contrast, Mary and the Witch's Flower was an attempt to revitalize a feeling and emotion of meeting someone for the first time, something that resonated out of Ghibli's earlier works, movies like My Neighbor Totoro, among many others. I'm blanking on a bunch, but Totoro is just an iconic example. As a whole, while it may come off as a normal, run-of-the-mill adventure plot to most people, in actuality, Mary and the Witch's Flower is an analogy for Studio Ponic's upbringing. After the film's release in Japan, it opened at number two in the box office with approximately 3.75 million US dollars or 428 million yen en route to earning 2.9 billion yen or 27.6 million US dollars. After the film was released, New York-based distributor G-Kids acquired the North American rights to the film and made its premiere on January 19th, 2018, where on that day alone, the movie made over a million dollars and way past 50% of the 2.4 million it earned over three months, and it made over a million on day one. As for the award circuit, as expected, it was put on the Oscar shortlist for the best animated feature, but didn't go farther than that. While at the Japanese Oscars, it did get a nomination alongside another fantasy adventure film, Napping Princess, the 21st goddamn Detective Conan movie, and Fireworks, a film who I've yet to see anyone say they like it. But the movie would lose to Masaki Yuasa's Tanami Galaxy companion piece, The Night is Short Walk on Girl, and in July 2018, the film became available on Netflix in the United States, where it currently stays as of the making of this video. The music was done once again by Takatsugu Metamatsu, who had also done the score for Marnie, and it was also during the time where another film would be released where Renamatsu also did the score as well. That is another Masaki Yuasa film, Lou Over the Wall. Playing the ending theme song, Rain, is the J-pop band Sakai no Awadi, which in English translates to the end of the world. Listening to the song in connection to the film, it does fit pretty well, especially with the fantasy vibe and the magical feeling that you get from the instrumentation, the lyrics about mirrors and the sky and of course rain really fit in with what the song was meant for which makes sense when you see clips of the band talking to Yonobayashi and Nishimura. As with films like this one in the past, the score amplifies nearly every scenario and amazing visual it accompanies and the most fascinating part of the music and a huge part of what makes it hit isn't about the score itself, but about a certain someone who played on it. Playing on a percussion string instrument known as a hammered dulcimer on the film's soundtrack is Joshua Messick, who currently has a YouTube channel shy of 10,000 subscribers and has been posting on it as far back as 2012. According to his description of the video Hammered Dulcimer on Mary and the Witch's Flower soundtrack featuring Joshua Messick, he explains how he always wanted to work on a film soundtrack and was discovered by Muramatsu, Yonobayashi, and Nishimura through his work on his CDs and his channel, through videos that you are seeing clips of right now on this video. He also mentions how Yonobayashi is a huge supporter and wanted to introduce an instrument like the hammer dulcimer to the world and even designed the witch's wands after the mallets that he uses to play them. 
With this contribution, Mary and the Witch's Flower became, according to Josh, the first feature film to highlight the hammered dulcimer in a significant role. Uh, if you like the soundtrack or just want to vibe out and relax some soothing music, his Mary and the Witch's Flower video and his channel are both in the description for this video. In August of 2017, the English dub was announced for the film, which also drew in some hype and fanfare, again, because of the Ghibli connection, because there were so many great English dubs, uh, and just how high quality there are in general, and who they were able to get. And just like the Legendary Studios' many dubs, this one stays true to the source material by casting British voice actors to add the feeling that a story is being told and is set in the United Kingdom where the novel is set, such as Ruby Barnhill, who plays the titular character Mary. Uh, she is also known uh, around this time for playing the main character in Steven Spielberg's BFG movie, and Oscar winners Kate Winslet and Jim Broadbent playing the headmistress and the college's renowned chemistry teacher, respectively. Just like when I talk about a Ghibli film, it's not hard to recommend this dub, although I wholeheartedly won't blame you if you think otherwise. That's really all I can say about that. One of a few things I dug up while researching for this video is how quickly people jump to the gun into saying that while yes, some things make it feel like a Ghibli movie, as that's what I've been saying for a good amount of this video, it still doesn't excuse the fact that Mary and the Witch's Flower is a Ghibli ripoff. Oh my god! The fact that I heard someone give optimism to this argument is making me go mad. Because if there is anything that should never be called a Ghibli ripoff, it's this. Okay, okay, here's an example. A while ago, when I was going through Makoto Shinkai's filmography, I talked about his 2011 film Children Who Chase Lost Voices. Out of everything I talked about that Shinkai made, I said this was the worst one. Because it almost looked like he just binge watched a bunch of Miyazaki films and then just tried to make his own Miyazaki movie. What makes Lost Voices a ripoff and Mary and the Witch's Flower not a ripoff is the fact Shinkai did Lost Voices without Miyazaki's knowledge. While for Studio Ponic, they have an actual reason for making the film the way they did. It's because that's all they know. According to an interview by The Verge, Yonobayashi says that it feels oddly familiar with the certain Ghibli homages because the majority of the employees, if not all of them, came from that studio. They all worked under Miyazaki, and for some of them, that was their whole career. So when you see something that even looks reminiscent of Kiki's Delivery Service, Howl's Moving Castle, Castle in the Sky, or Spirited Away, it's because, chances are, the same staff worked on those movies. It's less of a ripoff and more of an homage to their former employer. Now, apart from having some of the same aspects, I still have to answer the question, what did I personally think of the film? And that, I say the best way to describe Mary and the Witch's Flower is, it's all right. The intentions were good and a part of the reason why I really liked it, but overall, it just never came off as memorable as a whole. There were a couple of moments where I admired its ingenuity, but it never really felt it amounted to much. The animation, of course, is fantastic, but it didn't feel like anything else left to those standards. All in all, if you are just a hardcore Studio Ghibli fan, go watch this. There's nothing wrong with it. It's safe. Even though it never hit me in any way, I do admire Studio Ponix's stance and mindset during the making of this film how they express their situation through their story, showing their personal endeavors of every staff member who had a hand in making history. And because of that, I can't wait to see what they'll make in the future.